As we know, the first people who lived here in Canada since before the 1900s were not Canadian. They were, in fact, the First Nations, or the Aboriginal peoples as they are mostly referred to. They owned the whole of Canada and they moved around freely, whenever and wherever. But then, during the early 1900s, there were many immigrants, mostly European settlers, who came to Canada. As more and more of these immigrants came, the natives were being pushed and forced into land that was reserved for them. These settlers wanted the natives to become a part of the Canadian society. They wanted natives to give up their culture and their traditions. So, they enforced the Indian Act in 1895 to encourage natives to assimilate or become a part of the English and French-speaking culture of Canada. They were banned from earning un university degrees or becoming lawyers and doctors and ministers, and they were considered status Indians, or not Canadians. It was as if they just lived here, but they weren't considered Canadian citizens. They were sent to residential schools that were run by Christian organizations. The Christians believed that if they taught the natives, then the natives would abandon their beliefs. They felt that they were saving Aboriginal children by teaching them the Christian religion. These kids would be mistreated and abused if they spoke in their languages or practiced their beliefs openly. The First World War came around in 1914. The Canadian soldiers started preparing for war. But what many people don't know is that the native people helped fight in the war as well. They also fought during the Second World War. When the First World War broke out, Sam Hughes, Canada's Minister of Militia, rejected the idea of enlisting native peoples for the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which was the army raised by Canada for service abroad during World War I. The main concern was that if the natives were captured, the Germans might refuse to extend to them the privileges of civilized warfare. This basically meant that if the natives were captured, then the Germans wouldn't give them the benefits of a civilized war. In, this, in spite of this policy, 3,500 status Indians enlisted. Many other native peoples, including Métis and Inuit, also served. Most of the aboriginals who served were not well known, but some of them were already famous or became famous during the war. Corporal Joe Keeper of Norway House, Manitoba, a runner in the 1912 Olympics, excelled as a middle distance runner in Canadian corps activities and won a military medal. Tom Longboat, the long distance runner in the 1912 Olympics from the Six Nations Reserve, also served. Corporal Francis Peg Mega Bow earned more medals than any other native soldier in World War I. Over 300 Aboriginal soldiers gave their lives defending their land, but only 30 to sur survive and were credited for their bravery. Even though they helped save their country and their land during World War I and World War II, the natives still weren't getting any good treatment in Canada. In the 1920s, or the Roaring Twenties, they were still being mistreated by the Canadian government and its citizens. Their ceremonies, like the potlatch ceremony and the Sundance ceremony, were still banned and native children were still being taken away from their homes to be educated in residential schools run by governments or religious organizations. Anything connected to native language or heritage was excluded from school life in order for them to become a part of the Canadian life. If native peoples lived on reserves, they were not allowed to go. When they tried to move towards more independence, they were stopped by the government. Changes to the Indian Act in 1920 gave the Department of Indian Affairs the right to ban traditional forms of native government. For example, there was an independence movement in Grand River, Ontario that was strongly resisted by the Canadian government. In the 1920s, the chief of one of the tribes took the case of self-government for the natives to both the British government and the, Nati the League of Nations, which was the international peacekeeping body created after the First World War to stop the wars and make the First World War the war to end all wars. The government in Ontario was, uh, was uh, embarrassed by them and refused to give in their demands. So even though everyone, as in every Canadian citizen, got to experience the economic boom and prosperity, the natives were still struggling for their rights. The 1930s came along, and with it was the Great Depression, or Dirty Thirties. Everyone was having bad times, Canadians and Aboriginals alike. During the 1930s, Canada's natives were still being treated badly. Conditions in many native, Métis, and Inuit communities that were already difficult before the Depression now became much, much worse. Everyone who was hit by the economic slump were taken to relief camps and the government would help and support them. The Aboriginals, on the other hand, were completely ignored. The relief camp authorities seemed to assume that all native peoples could live off the land, so they were left alone. This may have been true for some groups of Aboriginal peoples, but others have long since abandoned the hunting and gathering customs of their forefathers. As for the natives in the Prairie provinces, they were sometimes prosecuted if they tried to live off the land. This was because food production during the Depression had decreased, therefore leaving a scarce amount of food. 
And of course, the Canadian government focused on feeding the Canadian citizens first, and the Aboriginal peoples last. So, the Prairie Provinces ignored Aboriginal traditions and Native rights under the federal law, and they began to charge the Native peoples who hunted and gathered on government property. The end of the Depression and the end of the 1930s came along, and with it came the start of the Second World War. Just like in the First World War, Aboriginal peoples felt that it was their responsibility and their duty to help fight and protect the land of their creator. But because they were not considered citizens of Canada, many Aboriginal peoples had to get permission from the Department of Indian Affairs to enter and join the Canadian Armed Forces. In order to gain this permission, however, Aboriginal peoples had to give up their status as registered Indians and become non-status Indians. What this meant was that in order to serve Canada and fight alongside the Canadian Army, they had to give up their native identity, and with it, their cultures and beliefs. Even so, more than 3,000 Aboriginal soldiers fought in the Canadian Army. The number of Aboriginal peoples who fought in World War II was much greater than the number of Aboriginals who fought in the First World War. The natives believed that if they were willing to go overseas and fight for their country, then they should also share the rights of all the Canadian citizens, including the right to vote. The group of Canadians who were not an immigrant group that felt the pain of intolerance the most were the Cana Canadian Aboriginals. Since before the 1900s, they had been fighting for their rights but getting no results. In 1946, the federal government created a committee consisting of members of the House of Commons and the Senate to change some things in the Indian Act. This committee learned of the hardships that many Aboriginal peoples faced. Native incomes were often a fraction of those of, Canadian, of other Canadians, and living conditions on the reserves were horrible, resulting in poor health. For the first time, Native leaders were given the opportunity to voice their concerns to the government. In 1951, the committee made some changes to the Indian Act, giving Native peoples more personal rights, like the right to perform ceremonies that had been illegal earlier in the century, like the potlatch ceremony and the sundance ceremony. Native leaders were also given more control of the reserves, although the Department of, Inter of Indian Affairs were allowed to overrule their decision if they seemed too far-fetched. This went on for a while, but then a problem arose in 1969 when Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau suggested to eliminate the special status for Natives. He said that there should be no special Canadians, whether they are English or French-speaking or Native peoples. He suggested that the Indian Act be abolished and Native peoples be given the same rights as other Canadians, but this isn't what the Natives wanted. The National Indian Brotherhood led the argument stating that Native people did not want the same rights as the rest of Canada. They wanted self-government and to maintain their culture. This crisis was argued for, the, for almost the next 30 years between the government and the Native peoples. It has become known by the 1970s that the Native reserves were unsanitary and unhealthy, and poverty, unemployment, and ill health were common. Government policies towards the Natives were becoming more harsh. For example, the Ojibwe of Grassy Narrows, Ontario had been forced to move out of the reserve and were relocated to a new reserve, which offered fewer economic opportunities than their old home. Their only source for drinking water was also their only source for fishing. The Ojibwe discovered later on that the river in which they relied on for food and water was highly polluted with mercury. In the 1960s, the native leaders stated that traditional rights and land claims had to be the government's top priority. But in 1969, Trudeau's government prepared a policy called the White Paper that ignored these priorities. Trudeau wanted equality between all Canadians, not favoring specific groups of Canadians. The White Paper suggested to cancel the Department of Indian Affairs, Indian status, traditional rights, as well as treaty rights. Everywhere in Canada, Native people started forming organizations in response to the White Paper. They all argued in complete agreement that the White Paper was unfair and should be canceled. The Native Indian Brotherhood was founded uh, to represent status Indians. So, they created the Red Paper in response to Trudeau's White Paper. This document argued that Natives must retain their distinct cultures. It also called for the, uh, for the right to self-government and for millions of dollars of spending to provide Natives with social services or welfare that was equal to those provided to the rest of the Canadian citizens. This reaction caused the Trudeau government to withdraw the White Paper in 1971. During the rest of the 1970s, the government funded programs to support Native peoples. Also, the government created the Indian Claims Commission in 1969 and the Office of Native Claims in 1974 to deal with the issue of land rights.
strength required elsewhere, jeopardizing our economic progress, and eating away at the world, commun world community's much-needed confidence in Canada. The federal government therefore urges all Canadians to join us in settling this question without further delay by renewing our federal tax and our sense of belonging to this country. Through this renewal will come the other changes, economic, social, and cultural, to which we are entitled. It is time for action. The objective of the document I've just tabled is precisely to start this process. It sets out the principles of this renewal and their application to the workings of our federal system and to the institutions provided for in the Constitution. It is no coincidence that it is entitled a time for action. It is our firm intention to take concrete measures according to a very specific timetable. A new proposition de renouvellement. To add the process for renewal, we set only two preconditions. The first is that Canada continue to be a true federation, namely a state where the federal parliament has real power and the provincial legislative assemblies have powers no less real. The second is that the freedoms and fundamental rights of the human being be written into the Constitution and therefore is sub uh, not subject to uh, interference from the other two levels of government. We want to be guided by the will of the citizens who have given us their mandate. When the white paper and red paper came out, the term being used was Aboriginal rights. It was used mainly to describe Native people's claims to property. The Office of Native Claims dealt with two kinds of land claims. Specific land claims, which are based on treaties and the, Nati and the Indian Act, as well as the comprehensive land claims based on traditional use and occupancy. As Aboriginal rights became more and more recognized, Native peoples began to submit their land claims to the Office of Native Claims. In the 1970s, Natives broadened their idea of Aboriginal rights to include nationhood and self-government. They created the Declaration of First Nations in 1975 to express their idea of their status as Canadian Natives. The Declaration stated some of the following. Number one, we, the original people of this land, know the Creator put us here. Number two, the Creator gave us laws that govern all of our relationship to live in harmony with nature and mankind. Three. The laws of our Creator define our rights and responsibilities. And four, the Creator has given us the right to govern ourselves and the right to self-determination. In the end of the 1970s, a wider definition of the term Aboriginal rights was brought up. The government began to realize the importance of fair negotiation with Native peoples on developments that affected them. The Quebec Premier Robert Borisaw announced the beginning of the James Bay Hydroelectric Project. This was a government hydroelectricity project that generates about 24,000 megawatts of electricity. It also takes up around 350,000 kilometers square of Quebec's land. The building process consisted of three steps, and only two of these three steps were completed. The third step was put on hold and is still on hold until today. This is because of the concerns on the environmental impact of the third step of the project. It disrupts areas in an extremely fragile ecosystem, as well as displacement of native peoples and the introduction of the dangerous levels of mercury into their food supply. Premier Borosaw's announcement of the project led to a great amount of protest from environmentalists, as well as from the Cree peoples and Inuit who lived in the area. The environmentalists said that the project would disturb a quarter of Quebec's land and would affect the ecology of James Bay. The Cree peoples and the Inuit argued that their hunting and gathering and fishing lifestyles would be ruined. In spite of these protests made by the natives in the area and the environmentalists, the government just went ahead and began phase one of the James Bay hydroelectric project. But then the government began to fear judgments and attitudes from the public. So they gave one, uh, $225 million as a final settlement to the Cree peoples and the Inuit, as well as fishing and hunting rights. Another project was the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Project, which would have affected a huge area in the Northwest Territories. But before the project began, the government made an investigation or inquiry to find out if the construction of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline would impact the land and the Aboriginal peoples living in the area. Thomas Berger, a member of the Supreme Court of British Columbia, led this investigation. He gathered information by, talking, by taking a survey from the many residents of the Northwest Territories. 
He wrote a report in 1977 going against the construction of the pipeline and banned the project for a 10-year period. During this time, the Inuit and other natives living in the area could work out a mutual agreement with the governments and oil companies involved, as well as settle land claims in the area. But only until early in 2000 did the native peoples consider signing an agreement allowing to continue the construction of the pipeline. Another important breakthrough or development in Native people's rights in the 1970s was the official realization that Natives are able to be responsible and look after their own community services. In 1972, the National Indian Brotherhood established the Indian Control of Indian Education Report. It focused on the importance of local control over education, teachers, and curriculum. The following year, the federal government in Ottawa actually listened to the policy and gave the control of education on reserves to Native bands or tribal leaders. Then, after education, they were also given the power to be responsible over their own water, sewers, and fire protection. The year after that, in 1974, Ojibwe of Gull Lake established Canada's first Native Reserve Police Force. Even though not all reserves experienced all of these breakthroughs, it was still a ray of hope to all Natives that, uh, that represented a mounting independence for Native peoples. In 1985, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau was replaced by Brian Mulroney. He promised to bring Quebec into the Constitution. Mulroney called a number of meetings to talk about constitutional problems. In 1987, Mulroney and 10 provincial premiers agreed to form the Meech Lake Accord, named after the area the agreement was signed, at Meech Lake, near Ottawa. The, or the accord was made to satisfy Quebec's concerns and allowed it to be recognized as a distinct society with its own language, culture, and legal system. But not everyone was happy with this agreement. Pierre Trudeau condemned the agreement, saying that it would fragment the country rather than bring unity. Also, women's groups and Aboriginal leaders thought they deserved more than they got from the 1982 constitution. Elijah Harper, Harper, an, an Aboriginal member of the Manitoba legislator, was concerned about the accord failing to focus on Aboriginal rights. Elijah Harper was born at Red Sucker Lake in Manitoba. He became chief of the Cree peoples at Red Sucker Lake in his early 30s, and then he managed to be elected to the Manish Manitoba legislature. He argued for Aboriginal rights during the Meech Lake meetings and stood against the accord because he did not support the Aboriginal peoples. Because of his, uh, his voice and his concerns and determination to fight for the Native peoples, he became a role model for young Natives, even today. He managed to take a while to discuss the accord with the rest of the Manitoba government, as well as he voiced his concerns for Aboriginal rights. But the Manitoba government couldn't show their determination in support of the accord before time for accepting it ran out. When Newfoundland found out that Manitoba did not pass the Meech Lake Accord, its legislator did not hold a vote, which cancelled the Meech Lake Accord. 